Hello, guys. Welcome back to our study of John. Today, we're going to see John 6, 52 through 59. Uh, just last week, we only saw five verses, 48 through 52. You know, it's it's interesting because we've we take so long in so little verses, but it's not because we take long, but because there's so much to talk about. And I feel like today is not going to be any different. But basically, for an introduction that I wanted to ask you guys, this is not necessarily an icebreaker. It's not a difficult question. It's not a personal question, I don't think. But what function does food serve in your body? Nourishment to nourish my body. Nourishment, yeah. Go energy. Up, keeps you going. Energy. One at a time, guys, please. Order. <laughs> Uh, oh, Evan, you first. What do you say? It fills you up and keeps you going. All right. What do you say, Daryl? Gives you energy. Energy. Yep. All those are correct. So if we just summarize all of that, basically, is what keeps you going. It's what gives you life. Allows you to live. We're gonna we're gonna read the verse. And, uh, we're gonna read the Bible, and we'll start our study after we pray. So. John 6, 53 through 59. Um, if you want to read it, that's fine by me. Um, uh, I want to read. All right. I'll be 53 through 59. Go ahead. So Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will rise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your fathers ate and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. All right, you're good. Don't worry. Um, we're going to go through all this, so we're just going to pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this moment, for this opportunity to learn more about your word, to be able to dwell all into you, because we want to know who you are. We want to drink of your blood and eat of your flesh, as you said right here. We want to understand what that means. And to be able to live the spiritual life that you want us to live. Because we are in this world to know you and to let you be known to others, God. Because we want to be saved. We want to understand uh, where salvation comes from. Why we need salvation. Why you have brought it to us. And thank you because you're good. You're so faithful. And you're so merciful to us creatures that just want to do evil. But you're good and you help us to do good in our lives. So help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Um, this is such a good passage. I love this passage. I, I don't know how many times we're going to say it, but John 6 is an awesome, awesome chapter in the Bible because of everything that it entails, the human nature, God's nature, the fact that us creatures that live on this physical world, we can't really under, seem to understand what the spiritual is or when Jesus is talking about the spiritual life. We learned this last, uh, last study the difference between the both of them and why it just we're just unable to see it we're unable to understand it it's like we just can't hold it so we're gonna kind of like make an emphasis on that again but we're gonna talk more about this whole passage because it's so so good uh, as a little context jesus is still here telling basically he's doing he's making a speech for the most part to he's talking about him about the bread that came from heaven to all these people around this place. And obviously the Jews don't like what he's saying. So they're trying to argue, not to him personally, but among themselves, they're like fighting uh, what, he, what he's saying. Here, if you just read uh, verse 51, uh, I'll just read it to kind of like, you know, context. I am the living bread, Jesus is saying, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then the Jews, therefore, quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
the first question that comes to mind was Jesus really offering his flesh for them to eat it <laughs> you know and that's the thing we, we learned it last study but basically Jesus is talking about a spiritual concept he's talking about something that's not quite physical however obviously because the Jews because they haven't received spiritual life because they don't have a, a relationship with with Christ with God in this moment they are unable to understand they have no no understanding of what he's saying they are literally thinking that he's really offering his flesh and his blood for them to eat it and drink it but that's why this study of today is going to be so important so good is because it helps us understand what Jesus is really saying so with no further to do we'll just go one by one through the verses and uh, we'll start with uh, verse 53 if anybody wants to read it I'll read it. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of, of man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. All right. So we're going to start with the questions. And first of all, the first question that comes to mind, uh, honestly, is, I mean, just to make, just to, you know, you understand, what do we have to do to have life? Well, according to that verse, it's like, eat that flesh. What else? And drink, and his, drink blood. his blood. Eat his flesh and drink his blood. <laughs> anybody reading this, anybody out, outside of the context we already kind of have laid down would think Jesus is a madman. <laughs> what is this man talking about? He's crazy. But that's not the case, if anything. He's being so spectacularly awesome. I, I can't put it any other way. It's so cool the way that he does it. With that in mind, right? If he's saying that's what we need to do to have life, what does it mean that we have to do that? Is he really asking us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? No. Uh, well, I think that I think that is is talking about um, the word of God, because the, this remember me two two important things. First, the Santa Cena it's a holy dinner, right? Yeah, communion. You can say okay. Communion. That that remembers me the the holy dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus uh, told to to his disciples the, the same thing, no, in in the dinner. The other thing that I can remember, it's when Jesus was tempted by, by the devil in the desert. Yeah. And the first temptation was Jesus was hungry and the devil said to Jesus, uh, if you are hungry, uh, take these uh, rocks and... Turn it to, uh, to bread. Yeah, yeah. And and Jesus told, uh, and Jesus responds, uh, Mm. Not, not not only by not only by bread I'm sorry and live but by every word that comes out of the mouth of god yeah yeah that, that's right so i think that here he's talking about the word of god and okay. and to do the will of god because the the verse 57 uh, i think that is very important because All right we're not there yet <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Yet, but, okay. But yeah. No. But that's that's a that's a great point. You know, he, Jesus could be saying the word of God here in a way that's more kind of like interesting. It's a way. It's an interesting way to put it. Uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But we're going to talk more about this, obviously, because we want to make sense out of this whole uh, conversation. So let's move on to uh, verse fifty-four. What does it say? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. How much life does do they have? Eternal. Eternal. Wow. Why eternal life, though? Because it's it's not just life on earth. Like it's life after death, too. Yeah. After death on earth. So it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing what this uh, what this can do. What will Jesus do to those that drink of his blood and eat of his flesh? He will 
He will raise them up at the last day. He will raise them up. Basically, just furthering the point that it is eternal life. Like you're gonna be, you're gonna have life in you. Let's go to John five. Actually, because it, it helps us understand this whole why. Why is he gonna give us life? Why is it eternal life? John five twenty six through twenty nine. Want me to read it? Yeah, sure. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. All right. Here we can learn, since we already study this, right, we can use it. We, we know the context, basically, in the sense that there is life in God because God is life. And since Jesus is the son of God, he has life in himself because the father has given it to him. As Because he's also given him the authority to execute judgment and to give him that authority to raise the dead, to call them. Uh, to be judged, to be resurrected, as it says here, uh, to either life or to condemnation. There's a clear difference. Uh, if you didn't know, everybody's going to be resurrected. Everybody is going to uh, be basically brought back, but it doesn't mean that everybody's going to have life. Um, but that's another point for another time. Just be aware of that. <laughs> when Jesus is talking about um, raising up those that eat his flesh and drink his blood, he's talking about giving them life, eternal life, as we've been seeing so far. Uh, let's go to verse 55. What does verse 55 say? For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. We're going to spend a little, a little time over here because this is such, a, such an spectacular verse. First of all, so we have already established the use of food for our body, right? That is basically what allows us to keep going. That's the reason why we're able to continue. If it wasn't for water, if it wasn't for, for food, you know, for fruits and stuff like that, we would be basically dead. We wouldn't be able to keep going. So then what purpose does the flesh and the blood of Jesus serve? If we have already real food, like everyday food, then why do we need this food? What is Jesus trying to tell us? Why is his flesh food indeed and his drink and his blood drink indeed? We have enough nourishment for our body right now. Why do we need this? What is this nourishing? What is why is this important? Why why would we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Spiritual. There you go. That's that's the key word. That's the key word for this whole for this whole chapter, honestly. This whole chapter is talking about the spiritual life. The Jews in this moment were seeking Jesus because he was fulfilling their physical needs. And they wanted to make him king because of that. And they were grateful to him because of that. To the point where they were, they were even going to take him by force. I don't know if that's very grateful, but they wanted to make him king because he is fulfilling those needs. But here, when Jesus starts talking to them, he starts saying, I'm not here only to fulfill your physical needs. I'm here to fulfill your spiritual needs because you need nourishment for your spirit. You need to drink my blood, to drink my blood and to eat my flesh. Because without that, you are going to be dead. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Right? So this is such an important concept for us to understand this is this is extremely important without jesus there cannot be any life he's basically telling us you um because spiritually you're dead you have needs that you don't realize you need because you're dead how would you what does a dead man need right you know, how exactly would they, how would it know and that's 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 also what we touched on last week is the fact that the the reason why they couldn't understand jesus's words the reason why they couldn't understand everything he was talking about is because they are dead. Their spirit is dead. If you didn't know 
before Christ, every human being is born dead in the spirit. And this is because of Adam and Eve. <clears throat> the second they were disobedient to God, they were, they were basically killed by their own selves. Their spiritual man died in that day when they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Unless you come to Jesus, unless you eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, you are not, you're not alive. You can be alive. There's no life in you. Yeah, go ahead, Nicole. I have a question. Sure. Um, since like we're talking about two components, right? Flesh and blood, what would represent or what's the exact meaning of both of them? No, that's, that, that's what, what I mean. Right. That's what we're trying to find out. Okay. But for the most part, we just have to understand that this is necessary, right? Drinking his blood and eating his flesh, right? It sounds weird, honestly. <laughs> sounds like, what is this cult? <laughs> but uh, but let's just, let's go with the madness. Let's go together and we'll we'll try to understand what it, match, what it means, each one. Uh, this is a cool thing. Jesus is making an incredible statement. I think it's an incredible statement because he's saying his flesh is food indeed and his blood is drink indeed. I personally think that what he means here is that his, the food that he's talking about is even more important than the food that we have every day, because it, it's like, this is it. This is the food. This is the drink. This is like overall. I mean, that makes sense because of the one I'm reading, it says, uh, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink, you know, saying real drink compared to you know that other stuff you guys right have. <laughs> exactly it's like but but jesus what do you mean like this is real food we we eat bread and we eat rice and meat and, but what do you mean that that's real food like we can't even see it we what do you well i mean unless you're talking about your literal flesh and your bl literal blood this is this is really an incredible statement he's talking about how food is not actually the most important your food that you eat for your physical body I mean, obviously it is important, but it's not as important as this, because as we can, we, as we have learned so far, this is what gives you life. So the question is, are we just physical beings or are we spiritual beings, you know, or are we both? And if we're just physical beings, then do we have no need for spiritual food or, you know, obviously if we go with what Jesus says, then we are both beings we're beings that are physical and spiritual and we do have a need for spiritual food what do you guys think what's the old saying mind body and soul yeah it's I'm not not like a, e even us uh, carnally mind minded people understand that there is something more than just flesh to us because if we were just flesh We'd be a lot like, uh, you know, a baboon in the forest or a cat on the street, you know? Right. Yeah, but th but there's something that sets us apart. And even though we most people are spiritually dead, there is people do recognize there's something different about most humans compared to most creatures in nature, you know? We would literally be animals in the jungle. There's no need to be all moral about anything. We would just be killing each other. Uh, eating each other i don't know doing doing whatever because there's no need for us to worry about morals there's no need for us to worry about the future about eternity <clears throat> nobody would have that in their hearts however the the bible itself already talks about how god has put eternity in the hearts of men everybody knows there's something else than this whether you want to live for it or not that's really up to every single person but it is that's the truth there's something more to life than just going, eating, working, working out, uh, having friends, hanging out with them, and just talking about some, some TV show or some video game or whatever. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying there's more to life than that. And so why am I just going to stick to that? Why am I not going to look for more? Why, if there's so much more to do, especially God telling me, you know, literally right here, and not just through here, but like literally in my face telling me how pointless it is to make riches in this world. Literally in a second, your life could just be cut from this earth. 
and all you fought or you worked for or you lived for was meant for nothing. It's just, that's, that was it. Good job. <laughs> you wasted your time. <clears throat> but that's, that's why God keeps on telling us, if you come to me, I will give you purpose. I will give you life. I will give you something that's even better than anything that this world could ever, ever give you. But that's why we have to have faith. We can't just follow something we don't believe in. We can't just do something we don't agree with. But God has been so merciful and given us all the clues, all the answers, every step of the way that I am here, that I am here. I am God. And I know that my path is best for you, whether you like to admit it or not. And that's the truth. I, I want you guys to look at this in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Oh, so here, I just wanted to, I'm not talking about the body, soul, and spirit by my own opinion. I will never, hopefully I'll never do that. Uh, if, if I do, please uh, be very clear. You're doing something wrong, Santiago. But uh, I just want you guys to see that the Bible does talk about what we have, and we do have three things. So we have to keep that in mind. We can't just be ignorant about that when it's a fact. First of Thessalonians 5, 23, if anybody wants to read it. Me, I have, I have it. You know, every time I click the unmute button, somebody else steals this from me. <laughs> we're, someday we're gonna have to use the hand system, but for now we'll just, all right, go ahead. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your spirit, soul and body be kept sound and blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is, clear as day. Um, I don't know what else to say. You do have a body and a soul and a spirit. Um, but as we talked about today in last classes, your body and your soul are alive right now, but your spirit is dead if you haven't been born again, which is why you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. And if you haven't, I would recommend you to read that passage, is John 3, for those in, you, in YouTube or anybody here. You must be born again. It is, Jesus said it. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this for myself. I'm not saying it because I, I feel like I'm special or whatever. But that's the, man, the commandment for every, per, every single person. You must be born again. And as, I, as we talked about last, last week, it's an incredible event. It's not something that's just like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian now. It's like I literally just went from this path to that path. Like 180, just completely turn your life. It's something, something happened. Something just happened and I have to make a decision. That's what it means to be born again. And that's why we pray, God, I want to be born again. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I want to speak in tongues. I want to cast out demons. I want to raise the dead. I want to do all these things that you said that I will be able to do if I believe in you. Let's also go to Ecclesiastes 3.11. Ecclesiastes. Oh, this is, uh, yeah, this is where, okay, cool. So we, we were talking about this just now. First of all, let's look at Ecclesiastes 2, 11. This is such a powerful, powerful verse. I love it. I love Ecclesiastes. Not actually like we could just read the whole book of Ecclesiastes today. <laughs> and that would be fine. <laughs> we're not going to do that. Um, so I'm going to read this one because I really like it. It's uh, Ecclesiastes 2, 11. And it says, then I looked on all the works, all the works that my hands had done. This was Solomon, the greatest, one of the greatest persons on earth, wisest man on earth, uh, obviously second to Jesus. But then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun no prophet and this man was an incredible person his kingdom was like none other in that time he was rich he had so many women he had so many things let's just say, let's just say it like that right and this person says everything that i did was pointless everything that i worked for was meaningless there was no prophet under the sun Everything was vanity. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. 
And then when you go, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry I'm putting this, it's not actually part of the study, but it's like so good. Um, I feel like it's needed. If you go to the, to the end of Ecclesiastes, in uh, Ecclesiastes 12, here's how he concludes this whole book. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. It's so, it's so cool. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So the only, the only point that he found, the only meaning, the only purpose that he found that was worth it, that was meaningful in life, was fearing God and keeping his commandments. And it's, it, it is, that really is, that really is. Everything that you do on this earth outside of basically knowing God, serving God, is for the most part meaningless. I'm sorry to say, if you don't like that, I mean, don't, don't take it up with me. You know, there's, there's a guy upstairs that you, know, you can talk to him. He will tell you all things. So we're going to go back to this. Ecclesiastes 3, this is what I wanted to talk, 9 uh, through 11. If anybody wants to read. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So here I just wanted to, as I said, emphasize on the point that every person does have that feeling of there's something missing. There's something more to life. Uh, Solomon summarizes this by God has put eternity in the hearts of men. So we are seeking for that, that which is eternal. We are seeking for that, which is meaningful, uh, purposeful. That is what we want. That's what we're looking for. That's what I looked for. <laughs> the reason why I'm here today, the reason why I became a Christian, I became a believer. The reason why my whole life changed was because I had no meaning. I had no purpose. Life was just painful and annoying and worthless to me until I found him, until I found Jesus. He gave me all the meaning, all the purpose that I was looking for. It's, it's so, it's so awesome. Like I, I regret nothing in my decisions of meeting God, of seeking him, of knowing him. It's been a wonderful time. All things considered, I mean, it's been, it's been difficult. I'm not going to say it, was, it wasn't difficult, but it's been so worth it. And God wants to do the same thing for every single person. But they're looking for eternity in the wrong things. They're looking for purpose in the things that have no purpose. But that's why God is so good in, in telling us in his word that there's no meaning outside of him. Not because he does not, not because he hates us, not because he doesn't want us to enjoy life, but because he wants us to find the real meaning. He wants us to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what the that's what the Bible says. So let's go back to this. Um, it it, it kind of reminds me of what we've said in previous lessons. Was it seek ye first the kingdom of God? And of course, he doesn't want us to. Uh, he wants us to enjoy life because why else would he have made the earth? You know, right. God just wants us to enjoy everything in his time, in the moment that it's supposed to be done. He just wants us to be obedient and he wants the best for us. Why are we going to spit on his face when he's been so kind to us? Right. You know, if he doesn't say something is right right now, then listen to him. But if he says that something is right right now, then listen to him as well. What are we talking about is what are people looking for in life? They're looking for purpose, for meaning, for happiness. That's what people are looking for. To feel safe. <laughs> yeah. All those things. People are looking for all those things. So let's go, let's go to Matthew. Do people find them? That's the question. Do people find them? So we're gonna we're gonna go to Matthew 10, 34 through 39. The first part might not make sense, but uh, I'm sure by the end, by the time we read the whole thing, it'll make sense and what we're, what I want to talk about, what I felt like it's needed to, you know, to be talked about. So, yeah, I'll read it. 
Sure, go ahead. All right. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, uh, I don't know. I'm like, if, if this is being, if I'm being too harsh on you, I'm sorry, but I just love this so much. Like when God confronts me, it's, I just, I don't know why, but I love it. It's like, thank you because I'm, I know that he loves me and I know that he wants the best for me. So he wants to tell me the truth. And this is so necessary for us to listen to as Christians, as brothers and sisters here, because People think that Jesus is, oh, he's such a good guy. He's such a loving person, you know, which he is. But here we're clearly looking at his mind. He's saying, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. To put man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Why is that? Because the t- for the moment you start proclaiming Jesus as your savior, as your Lord, that's going to bring conflict with a lot of people, not just with your family, but mostly your family, but also with your friends, with the people around you, because they're seeing that there's, there's something wrong with this person. This person is different. And we don't like that. We don't like different here, especially those that say they're, that they believe in God and who can blame them really? Because so far Christianity has done a really bad, has put a really bad name on God because they, all they're asking for is money. All they're asking for is things of this world. But that's not what it's what this is about. This is about the spiritual life. But we're not going to talk about that right now. Yeah, it took me a while to kind of I, I you know I haven't heard this passage before, so I kind of looked at it and I was kind of like, I have to think about this for a second. It's just reading as like slowly starting to get it, and then you just put put the answer down. I was like, oh okay, I get it now. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason. He's not. He's not. <laughs> he's not trying to make us kill each other in our in our house. <laughs> But really, it's just the fact that once you start proclaiming Jesus in your own in your own household, which is probably the first place you're gonna do it, they're gonna become enemies of you because yeah, they don't be, want because, that. Because um, being a Christian, whether people like to admit it or not, is actually really divisive. Because you you just sort of stand up and say this is the truth, and everyone goes, "Well, why do you think that's the truth, huh?" Yeah. Isn't morality subjective? And you go, "No, this is the truth," and people will fight you tooth and nail to try to disprove you, you know? Yeah. But, but that's the thing. That's the reason why we don't want to argue with people in the, in the points points of faith, because this is a faith based uh, system. This is not a a facts. This is not, I mean, for us, for me personally, there's a lot of facts like, like unmovable facts, but in the end it is based on faith. Um, So yeah, it is very divisive. Being a Christian is going to be divisive. That's the point. That's the reason why Jesus said that he didn't bring peace. He brought a sword because you have to be, you're going to be divided uh, between the people that believe and the people that don't believe. And that's really where it stands. So the question that I was asking though, to get back in, on topic is, will people find me, will people find meaning or purpose in, in life outside of God? The answer is Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, if you haven't seen it, I've seen it plenty of times. People find purpose in money. People find purpose in relationships and positivism and, and motivation, whatever. I don't know. Here, Jesus is saying, he who loves father or mother, there's people that love their fathers and mothers a lot and probably more than God to the point where they will listen to them when they tell them, stop going to that church or stop you know, reading your Bible or whatever, or we're going to disown you, right? Because that just that does happen. Um and then he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me because it also happens the other way around. Um, a per, an older individual starts getting into the God, into the Bible, into church, and their sons or their daughters disprove of that, right? As well as they, they might just, they, it could also be, I just want to serve my, my father or I just want to serve my, my son or my daughter more so than I want to serve God. 
that also is, as he's saying, he who loves them more than me is not worthy of me. And as well, it says that he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he says that because the, living a life of faith is not necessarily, as I said, it's not an easy one. It's a life where you're constantly going to have to be, you know, fighting a, a battle on all fronts with yourself, with your family, with Satan, with the demons, with, uh, with your brothers and your sisters, with all this. And it's constant fighting. And I want to re reiterate, if you are a Christian, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't be don't be like, wow, that's like, that's a lot. But because God is going to be with you and nobody's going to beat God. Nobody's going to, who's going to destroy, who's going to dethrone him? Nobody. And if anything, he's, he's so strong that he makes, he makes people like me believe in him. People like me trust him. People like me serve him. And I, I know you guys haven't really met who I was, uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't the best person. And I still am like, fighting with a lot of things. I still, you know, have to become better. And I'm sure every one of us here can say the same thing. So the, the, the point that I wanted to make, though, is he, here he says, he who finds his life will lose it. Here he is re reiterating what we already said. People will find life. Will, people will life. People will find meaning and purpose in the things of this world. It's going to happen. But what does it say right here? He says, he who finds his life will lose it. He will lose it. And then lastly, he says, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And this is where, you know, it's up to you to choose. Do you want to lose your life? I'm not talking about your literal life, unless you, you know, unless that's what, that's what needs to be done. But He's talking about, are you willing to die to yourself? And also, are you willing to lo uh, lo risk losing the life that you have been living? Because as we said, if you're, tr if you're Christian, you can proclaim that this, you know, this is the truth and the way people are going to figuratively kill you by, by disassociating themselves from you, you know? Yeah. So, so you'd lose your life in another way, too. Yeah. No, yeah. And that's, that's, that's what I was, you know, that is the point is the fact that well, who are you today? Who, who are you being? What, are, what, is your, what is your purpose? What's your main goal? What's your importance? Why are you here? You know, and that's a, that's a deep question. But that's a, that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. You know, what are you hoping to do in the future? What is, the, what is your goal here? What are you hoping for? Is it money? Is it fame? Is it relationships? Is it you know, there's so, so many things in the world that you can follow, you know, is it video games? Is it gambling? Is it a smoking, drinking? You know, it doesn't all have to be, is it your, you know, it could be good things or bad things, but even though we think it's good things, it's a bad thing because in the end, if, if, if all you want is a family, that's going to fulfill you and you're not going to look for God anymore because you're looking for your family. And even though family is a good thing and working probably is a good thing as well, if that's your purpose, if that's your meaning, it's a bad thing. <laughs> Sorry to say, because that shouldn't be your purpose. Your purpose should be to serve God. Your purpose should be to know him, to lose your life for him. And uh, that's the, probably one of the most hardest things that Jesus is saying right here. God, losing my life for you? I don't, I don't know, right? That's so hard, such a, such a hard decision. I mean, not for now, when I look at it from now, it's, it's not, it's not a, this is, it's not a bad decision at all. If anything it's like, do I want $1 or do I want a million dollars? It's like, but that's, but we're so blind to the truth. We're so blind to the, the matter, the facts, the matter of facts. That we don't understand that this is the best possible path ever because god is not just offering you a good life on this earth and okay i mean reasonably good um but a, an eternal life an incredible life in heaven for eternity i mean what more could you ask for 
but people do have that issue. And I can say that personally for myself, even though I didn't really have many aspirations as when I was younger, God, losing my life for you, stop playing video games for you. That was my, that was my thing. That was my thing. Video games. <laughs> so stupid. You know, you want to lose your whole life playing video games, but that's what I wanted. And not just video games, but women too. Women was like up there as well. It's okay, <sighs> you're a guy. That's like what all guys want. Yeah. I mean, but still, you know, uh, stop playing video games to serve you. Stop, stop trying to find women to serve you. Ugh. I just, I don't, it's not, it doesn't seem reasonable to me. Like, can I, can I do that and then that at the same time? Can I do both together? Is that okay? Is that, no, <laughs> no, it's not okay. Because either you want all of me or you don't. And you can't serve two gods. You, yeah, yeah, you can't. Yeah, that's Matthew 6 right there. If you guys want to read it on your own time. You can't serve two gods because you either you will... Love the other, love one and hate the other, or appreciate one and not the other. You can serve God and money. So it's it's really it's really God is telling us, what do you want? Because I'm willing to give you everything. And everything that I have is so, so good. It's so worth it. It's meaningful, it's purposeful, it's amazing. And the only thing you have to do is believe in me and choose me. That's all you have to do. And I'm going to be there with you. I'm the God that created the whole universe. I'm the God that created every single person on this earth and every system behind it. Do you think that I cannot do something in your situation? Do you think that I cannot help you? Do you think that I cannot be there for you and move every single piece so that you can have a better spiritual life? an intimate time with me <laughs> if like how do you how else do you want to see it how else do you want to think about it he's willing to move heaven and earth for you if you just ask him but i'm not talking about materialistic things don't get that don't get that twisted we're not talking about money here we're not talking about fame or anything like that that's the furthest thing that i would want I'm talking about the spiritual life, the meaningful, purposeful eternity. And he's willing to do everything so you can have a life of serving him, of loving him, of just being able to. I, <laughs> I've never had so much peace, so much happiness, so much tranquility than when I'm serving him, than when I'm seeking him, than when I'm loving him. It's so wonderful. It's so awesome. Like, thank you. Thank you for being so patient with me. Thank you for being so merf merciful with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I don't deserve any of it, but you did it. Thank you. Thank you. Because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. I wouldn't be here. It was all you. Thank you. My life without meaning, without purpose. You gave meaning. You gave me purpose. You gave me everything that I shouldn't got, that I shouldn't have received. And I can't do anything for it but to believe in you. Right? And he's willing to do that for every single person. And that's so awesome. And really, I'm just here to tell you that. And I want you guys to know that. And I want you guys to believe it. Because it's true. And it's not like something that just happened 50 years ago. It's something that's been happening for over more than 10,000 years. People that have trusted in God and have not been led astray. Thank you. I just want to keep saying thank you. <laughs> and I want to cry and I want to pull my arms out because I've, I, I've seen it with my own eyes. God is so good. We don't deserve him. We don't deserve any of him. But he wants to be with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And I cannot stress that enough. 
That's the point of John 6. He wants us to have a relationship with him. But people are, are out here just looking for him, for his benefits. This is not a friends with benefits relationship. This is not anything like that. This is like, I'm putting my life for you. Do you want to put your life for me? And you don't have to do it first because I'm doing it first. And that's it, right? So let's get back on track with this study. And um, let's go for, let's go to the verse 56. What does it say? I'll read it. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Right. So what other thing happens when we eat of his flesh and drink of his blood? We abide. He abides in us and we abide in him. We basically become so intertwined. We, we abide in him. <clears throat> Let me just go back here so I can see it. Verse, what were we? 55, 56. 56. So if you eat of his flesh and you drink of his blood, you will abide in him and he will abide in you. This is a great promise. Uh, God, God abiding in you. Who would have thought? Not me. How do we know that we are abiding in him, though? This is really where we want to start answering that question of what is what does it mean to eat his flesh and to drink his blood because we've been obviously wanting to answer that so what does it mean that you're abiding in him that you live you live your life to do his will he helps you accomplish that okay anybody else well, I see it in this way. Um, that, okay, since we're with him and, like, he's in us, well, I believe that God is seeing he's seeing us through him. So that's why probably that's about more about his flesh. I mean, through his body or, like, he is, like, God is seeing us through him. That's why that's the important, important part of being remaining there. Well, I don't know. All right. Anybody else? Like, uh, become a bonded with him, abides in me and I in him. So it's, it's like you, you get more connected. Yep. Honestly, like all three of the answers are basically on, honestly on point because we are being bonded together with God. So it's a beautiful relationship. It's a relationship. I think any of us would want, I definitely want a relationship like that and not just with God, but with the person that whoever it is meant for me, right? Just having that understanding, having that love for each other, that sacrifice, that love, really, it's, it, that's where everything emanates. God is love, but it's not the love that's fake, that's plastic. It's the love that will tell you the, how things are the moment that you're doing something wrong. It's the love that will be responsible. It's not, it's not necessarily, it's not a human love. It's, uh, it goes beyond that <laughs> many, many times. But thankfully, God has set in place the love between a woman and a man to kind of help us understand the love of God for his church. And I think that is, that is, uh, that is definitely true. Um, but his love does go above, beyond that, honestly. You uh, raised your hand. Juan, what's up? This, um, you, you, you say the word, uh, the relationship, the relationship relationship yeah <laughs> that the, the verse uh, 56 it's talking about that he's living in us and we are living in him and that remembers me uh, a verse in the book of Revelations Revelations 3 20 right. that says listen I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him 
and have dinner with him and he with me. It's, I think that it's, this is a, a beautiful verse that is talking about that relationship that if, if we are eating the bread and drinking the blood of Jesus, I think that we are giving the permission to Jesus come to our hearts, to our lives. Yes. Yeah. And if, if we do that, he will give us eternal life. All the, we, we, we saw it, the, 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 the last uh, group, right. the last Thursday. He said that he is the true, the way, and the life. And that is the way of, of, of this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how to say it in English. I can't explain it, but it's very beautiful. Though. Yeah, no, I understand completely. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're but... good. Yeah. Or with it, that, it's... With using the, um, it, it, it does, you did uh, kind of make, have something make a little bit more sense than it already did for me. It's like, well, once again, talking spiritually, um, he knocks at your home, your house. Well, what's your house spiritually? It will probably be, be like, the body because your spirit lives in your body so if he knock, knocks knocks at your house and then you let him in to meet with you spirit to spirit more like kind of more or less um and then you you know do all we just said uh, break break bread with him and then you'll you'll have it have eternal life if, if i'm getting a little bit no no we, across. no you're good for example we did talk about this like two weeks ago i think or yeah it might be two weeks ago or three but basically this is this is really how we kind of like summarize his love is the fact that he was the one that came to our door and knocked on it he's the one that said i want to eat with you open the door and it's up to us to open that door and, and i think in the bible even says that you should treat your body like a temple while well, using the living in something analogy you could switch out temple with house you know yeah it says yeah if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come into him and dine with him and he with me so what happens is i can't collect my words or my thoughts or what i was supposed to say so hello guys this is after the study uh, i was looking through the video and i realized that i i wasn't able to think what i was thinking so now I'm able to say it. I'm able to recollect everything that I wanted to say and say it in a better way than what I was trying to say before uh, because I really went on a deep end on something that wasn't necessary. So basically, when God knocks on your door of your heart, of your life, you're going to know. It's going to be noticeable. You're going to feel it in your chest. You're going to feel it in your body. You're going to feel like there's something moving you to make a decision. And it's up to you to personally make that decision in that moment. What do you want to do? Do you want to fight or do you want to fly? Right? Fight or flight feeling. Um, and really, the only reasonable thing here is to, to fight. And that fight basically just means opening the door for him. When you're listening to a message, when you're listening to a sermon, when you're listening to somebody talk about God, and you feel something inside that's just telling you, you know, that's confronting you, that's showing you who you are, that's convicting you. That's the Holy Spirit. And that is God knocking on your door. And he's telling you to open the door for him. So if that's happening to you in this moment, or and at some point, if it happened to you, then I will, I would, I would encourage you or motivate you, or just plainly and simple, just tell you that don't flee from it if anything go to it allow that to happen in you allow that the holy spirit to enter into you to eat with you to have that relationship with god the relationship that he wants you to have with him because he does and if he is knocking on your door it's going to be obvious it's going to be noticeable like you might others might not be able to tell but you will and if you're able to see that something is happening in your life in any message in any time when somebody's talking about about God to you, then that's the time. And he is knocking. 
it doesn't have to be at your house just doing whatever that just something's gonna happen out of nowhere and the holy spirit's gonna come or some t um, or an angel or something's gonna tell you no it doesn't have to be like that it's just as simple as you're listening to a message you're listening to somebody talk the gospel the true gospel the gospel of jesus christ the gospel of salvation to you that message will make you be convicted and will make you see the things that you haven't seen before and it's up to you to make that choice do you want to believe him or do you not do you want to choose him or do you not as just as what we just read in revelations he knocks on the door those who open the door will eat with him and dine with him because he wants to eat with you and dine with you and it's really a choice that he makes but in the end it will become your choice to make as well because he's not he didn't make robots he didn't make machines to just do whatever he tells them to he makes people to choose what they want to choose and that's how we know that god loves us because we have the ability to choose him and that's how god knows that we love him because even though we're in this world filled with corruption with hate with prejudices with persecutions and liars and thieves and prostitutes and all these other things that maybe you and i am you know because we're not saints here if anything we're all sinners that are just looking for a hospital we're looking for a place that will love us that will accept us that will forgive us and this is a place god is here to forgive you and he's here to help you change your ways change your path to his path so i just encourage you if he's telling you that um you're gonna know uh you're gonna if he's knocking on your door you're gonna know so don't be discouraged. If anything, just say yes. If you feel like you can, like there's no way, like, yes, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can open that door. His son paid for your sins. His son died for your sins on the cross. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. If you feel guilty, if you feel shameful, whatever you may be feeling, he paid for your sins. He wants to forgive you. He already he already paid for it. But it's up to you to choose to believe that. And I'm not here to tell you you're going to have facts in front of your face. This is about faith. And faith is what pleases God. And I'm not going to tell you otherwise because that's what the Bible says. So have faith. Believe Him. And I'll let you guys continue on the video. Sorry for this. You know, I just wanted to say the things that I, I should have said, but here you go. Let's go to verse 57. What does it say? Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This just kind of reminds me of a previous lesson where we said um, no one gets to the father but through the son you know yeah the question here is basically from where does life emanate emanate as in come from yeah jesus because of the father yeah so life emanates from the father and since the Father sent Jesus, who has life as well? Jesus. Jesus. Because he comes from God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, right? So since Jesus came from God, he also has life within himself because the Father gave him life. Therefore, anybody that abides in him, anybody that feeds on him, will also, by that reasoning, have life in themselves. Does that make sense? All right, um, verse 58. What does it say? This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats his bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. I just wanted to make an emphasis on this whole journey that we've had from john 6 25 through 59 because it's an amazing journey we've learned so much 
but this is basically the culmination of it all. The summary is, Jesus is the bread which came down from heaven. And what will happen if you eat of this bread? You'll have eternal life. You will have eternal life. You will have purpose. You will have meaning. You will have everything. Unlike the people of Israel that ate the manna in the desert and died, if you eat from this bread, you will have eternal life. And where did this happen? Where did this take place? In verse 59. In Capernaum. Capernaum. In the synagogue, right? In the synagogue, synagogue in Capernaum. So this is, this is important because we actually didn't know where Jesus was. But it actually makes a lot of sense because the, the Jews were looking for Jesus. And one would think, well, how did, were they able to find him? Well, lo and behold, Jesus went to the synagogues to preach to the people. So obviously they were going to be able to find him there. Wow. He showed up, he showed up on the steps of the White House, <laughs> basically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the only place where Jesus would be at. It, it makes complete sense, um, which is cool because we didn't know that until now. So now we know he was, Jesus was in a synagogue and he was uh, basically telling the people that he is the bread come down from heaven, which the Jews clearly know what Jesus was talking about um, because they read the, the scriptures in that time, it, they would call them um, over and over again. And when Jesus was talking about the bread of life, they were instantly going back into Exodus when all these things happened. And God gave them the manna. Well, the bread came down from heaven. Here, Jesus is saying, I am the true bread, which came down from heaven. And well, here, I just want to finally, since we finished, I want to take time to talk about what do you guys, now that we've done all the study, you know, what do you guys think it means to eat the flesh and to drink the blood of Christ? For eternal life not just life on earth it's more it's more important than the food and drink that we consume way more important even though we need it yeah so first of all first thing we, we noticed for this whole thing is this is more important than your everyday food like extremely important what else well i was I from what I got from this was basically to, to, um, to eat his flesh and drink his blood is basically, well, first of all, as we always say, you have to believe in Christ, but you also need to sort of t take on, was it, bear your crosses and believe it and take him on and have him sustain you through whatever you're doing, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, you know? Yeah. K kind of like, um, once again, previous lessons. Someone at the well, the la lady at the well. I have a, I have a water that you know nothing about. That's that's why what I was always relating the drinking his blood to was at the the lady of the at the well when Jesus asked for water. So, you know, I mean, yeah. yeah. Any anybody else? Eat the flesh, drink his blood. It's such a, such a explicit image. It's such a, like, wow. It's such a weird, it's a weird way to put it. Jesus, eat your flesh and drink your blood. Um, I mean, this is why I always try to substitute things that basically mean the same thing, you know? It's, it's interesting because if we, if we look through John, we actually see that this is the only time that john will talk about uh as uh, juan said the communion uh the holy dinner john doesn't really make an emphasis on it uh throughout the whole gospel of john as much as he does in this place this is the little play the little place where he explains what it means to drink of the blood and to eat of the flesh in commu communion we're actually gonna go Unlike the other Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they talk about it in the place where it happens. So we're actually going to go to one of those. If you guys want to go to Luke 22, and you'll see just how similar the words that Luke uses are the same as John, because obviously they're not 
they're not coming up with it. They're just uh, stating the words that Jesus already said uh, before. So Luke 22, verse 14 through 20. Uh, anybody that wants to read it? Yeah, I read. All right. So when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come, or it comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is said for you. If... If you guys didn't understand what Jesus was talking about before, I'm sure, I, I hope that you guys understand what it is, what it's actually talking about now. Um, Jesus was talking about communion. Jesus was talking about if you're abiding with him, you are going to, you're going to follow through with this because this is what God, this is what Jesus wanted us to do. Every time we drink of wine and we drink uh, and we eat bread uh, in communion with our brothers and your sisters, this is what we're, remind, we're being reminded of. The sacrifice that God paid with his life, with his body, with his blood, so that we may be, um, so that we may have a relationship with him, so that we may be able to restore that which was lost, so that we may be able, be, be able to have a spirit within, our, within ourselves so that we can know all the mysteries of God. Does that make sense? When he says you have to drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, he's basically saying you have to have communion with me. You have to partake with me. You have to basically do what I'm asking you to do. All around the world, there are Christians like us having this time. Uh, sometimes they, they put it as the first Sunday of the month. Sometimes it's the last Sunday of the month. But they basically, in church, they have communion. And this is what he's talking about. We... We are meant to be communing uh, with each other, remembering what Jesus, his sacrifice. Um, and if you guys will look, Jesus was with fervent desire. I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he says also, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. When all of us are back, when all of us are together in the kingdom of God, we will have communion with Jesus and he will have it with us. Just going back to what Revelations 3 say, if you open the door, I will come and eat with you. We're going to be eating in the same table with Jesus, reminding ourselves of everything that he's done, how awesome his work has been, that his body that was sacrificed paid for our sins, that because of his blood, we are righteous before God. It's not by our justice, but by the work of the cross in Jesus so just remember that this is what Jesus was talking about in John 6. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's interesting, but it's very, very decisive and divisive. And it's up to you to make that decision. Uh, but we're going to talk more about this next week because it's such an important topic. And I love what we're going to see next week. Next week is, it's amazing. I love it. Everything about it for now. Just know that you are abiding in God. You are eating of the blood, eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood when you have communion with him, when you're praying, when you're reading your word, when you're doing the will of God, when you're telling people about him, because that's what he has, he, he's, he has meant for us to do. That's what he sent us to do is to proclaim the gospel to every nation, to every people in every tongue, right? So with that being said, do we have any question, any comments, concerns? No. If you haven't had communion before, I, I really encourage you to do it. Uh, obviously, 
if you don't have a church or whatever, it's understandable, I guess, but I don't know, just find like two or three people to be with one or two people to be with you and just, uh, you know, have that time of communion and just, you know, appreciate, appreciate that sacrifice that Jesus did for every single one of us. Mm. We can talk a lot about communion and everything that has to do with it, but I'm sh I feel like that's a whole study on its own. So we're not going to do that today. Uh, maybe someday we will. I'm not sure. But for now, you know, just know that. All right. We're going to pray then. Cool. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this moment, for this opportunity to be able to talk about you, to be able to see everything that you've been able to do in my life and everything that you're going to do in the life of others. Help me to talk, to say, to say everything that you want me to say, to talk about you, to get to know you and to know, yeah, and to allow others to know you, because that's our purpose as, as Christians, as followers of Christ. We want to know you and to let others know you, because that's what you, that's what you have called us to do. Thank you, Lord, because you have set your flesh and you have set your blood as a sacrifice worthy of, of perfect before God. And that we've been able to eat your flesh and drink your blood because we want to have communion with you. We want to abide in you. We want to belong to you, God, because there's nothing greater than this life. Help us to find our purpose in you and to seek you every day because we want to do your will. Or at least if we don't, help us to want to do your will. Help us in our difficulties. Help us in, our, in the things that we are still having an issue with in our lives, things that we don't understand, things that we want but are not right for us, things that we're hoping for but maybe are not the best for us. Tell us the truth. Tell us how it is because we know that you are a loving God. And since you're loving, you will discipline us accordingly. Show your love through your discipline. Show your love through your word, through your truth, so that your truth may set us free. And if we haven't been born again, if we haven't gotten to know you yet, if we haven't spoken in tongues, then help us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Allow us to have that experience, that time, that moment, so that we may be able to make the choices that you want us to make. Because we cannot be spiritual beings if, if, if our spirit is dead. We want to be born again so that we may be able to see and understand everything that you have for us and everything that you're saying. Please, God, help us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. All right, guys. Well, we'll, we'll see each other again next week. Bye-bye.